الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد So tonight بإذن الله by the permission and the grace and the blessings of Allah Azza wa we will be starting the first hadith in the collection of 40 hadiths in Tazkiyatul Nafsi wa Islahul Nufus in the purification of the heart and reformation of the soul and the body too because the body is a derivative of the actions and the status of the soul. So inshallah today's hadith, first hadith that I will read both in Arabic and then in English. And in fact, I've switched from Lafzul Bukhari to Lafzul Muslim. So I switched from the wordings of Bukhari to the wordings of Muslim. And the reason I did that is because the wordings of Muslims are the one that you will find in Al Arba'un al Nawawiya. Right? So if anyone has memorized Al Arba'un al Nawawiya, it will be the exact hadith over there. Or if anyone is going to memorize this hadith, you'll also find it in Al Arba'un al Nawawiya. So you would have memorized one hadith over there as well. So maybe that, inshallah, later on will give you the encouragement to memorize those as well, or at least to read it. So, and the difference between the lafz al-Bukhari and lafz al-Muslim is minuscule, it's very small, just a couple of words. So I'll read it, inshallah. So this is the first hadith. Inna al-halal bayin wa inna al-haram bayin wa baynahuma umurun mushtabihatun la ya'lamuhunna kathirun min al-nas. فمن فمن اتقى الشبهات استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كالراعي يرعى حول الحما يوشك أن يرتع فيه ألا وإن لكل ملك حما ألا وإن حما الله محارمه ألا وإن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب so here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Halal is clear and haram is clear. And between the two are ambiguous matters, doubtful matters that most people do not know their rulings. So whoever avoids the ambiguous matters will safeguard his religion and reputation. And the one who falls into them falls in the haram like the shepherd who grazes around the sanctuary and is about to cross into it. Indeed, every king has a sanctuary and the sanctuary of Allah is his prohibitions. And indeed in the body there is a morsel of meat that if it is well, the rest of the body will be well and if it is corrupt, the rest of the body will be corrupt and this is the heart. So this is the hadith. And this hadith is an important hadith because as I said, you'll find it in the 40 hadith Nawawis. But even before that, other scholars, as we've mentioned in the last lecture, other scholars have identified about three or four hadiths as foundational in Islam. They said the religion of Islam or all hadiths are built on three hadiths or four hadiths. Remember that, that we said last time? They identify this hadith as one of them, right? So it's a very important hadith. And you'll see in hadith, this hadith that it is divided into two parts. The part that talks about the halal and the haram and the ambiguous. And the other part that talks about the heart. So we will begin with the part that talks about the heart insha'Allah. Because this is what the series is dedicated to. Then we'll go back and we'll explain the first part. And we'll see then the connection between the two. Because there's a connection between the two. So why did the Prophet ﷺ mention this? and then talk about that, halal and haram, and then the heart, because there is a connection, a link between the two. So let's go to the heart. And I'll ask you first here to sort of do a small experiment. Imagine a time when you were really happy. I mean, really, really happy. Right? Think of a time. Right? Your heart was full of happiness. So, did you think of a time? Okay, good. Now, how was your body reacting to these emotions that you had? Were your eyes happy as well? The people, when they looked at you, they said, this is a happy person. Your eyes were happy as well? Now, what do I mean by your eyes were happy? 
you only could see good things. And even if you see a mistake, right, a shortcoming somewhere, they, you will look the other way. You will be very forgiving. Something negative, you won't even, you know, give it a second glance. Why? Because that's not what you want to focus on. We can take care of this later. Don't worry about it. Somebody bumps into you, right? You say, that's fine. That's okay. Somebody takes something that maybe you wanted on the shelf. What will you say? Go ahead. Go right ahead. Take it. So you're also your tongue is very happy. You know, it's just overflowing with kindness and pleasantness. Your tongue is happy. Your eyes are happy. Your body is happy. Okay. Now think of the opposite. Of a time where you were, when you were really sad. Okay. I won't ask you to remember that time when you were really sad. But what, how did you react? How did your body react? Were your eyes sad as well? Meaning what? whether you were sad or angry. Your eyes were sad or angry as well. Maybe you found the fault in everything. This is not clean. Why isn't it clean? This is not tidy. Why isn't it? You didn't do this. Your homework, right? You didn't call me. So you found fault in everything that is around you. It was gloomy. It was bleak. It was all black. Your tongue also was very sad or very angry. Somebody, the same person, right? He thought that you were really a nice person last time. You let him have that thing on the shelf. Next time he comes, he wants to grab it. You yell at him. That's mine. Not every time I'm going to give this to you. That's mine. Not every time you're going to take my parking spot. I gave it to you last time. Today, no, it's mine. Right? So you're angry as well. So this tells you that these emotions that we have, or let's say the heart that we have and the way that it feels, really influences, affects how the rest of the body reacts. Right? But not only in emotional sense, also, you know, subhanAllah, in medical sense as well. Your emotions control how physically well or unwell you are. So, for instance, they say that if you are depressed and sad, particular hormones on your body, right, start fluctuating. They either increase or decrease. So you will begin, if you are depressed, you will be more sensitive to pain. If you have a pain in your body and you're depressed, you'll be more sensitive to pain. You will feel it more because you're depressed. Your immune system will be compromised when you are depressed. So you're more likely to be sick. More likely, right, not to fend off, not to fight infections and diseases. More likely also that you will get a heart attack if you are constantly depressed. If it is the opposite and you're happy, there is some evidence to suggest that if you are happy, it physically makes you well. Some evidence suggests that. So subhanAllah, now consider all of this and what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if this part of your body is well, the rest of your body is well. And if this part of your body is not doing well, the rest of your body is not doing well. So even in medical terms, that is true. Right? As far as, far, as, far as the heart being what? That repository of emotions. But now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is talking about the heart being what? as the center of these religious emotions, religious feelings, and that how the heart goes, you go. How the heart goes and how what it has in it, it affects your eyes and your tongue and your hands and your feet and every, all, every part of your body, all of your limbs. So you want to see how you are, why you're acting this way, it goes back to the heart. Why am I looking at this thing? It goes back to the heart. Why am I listening to this thing? It goes back to the heart. And Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu is the famous companion, right? Had a saying. He said, "Al qalbu malikun wal a'da'u junuduhu. Fa ida taba al maliku taba junuduhu, wa ida khabuth al maliku khabuth al junuduhu." He says he gave a, another example. He said, "The heart is like the king, and the limbs, the body parts, are like what the soldiers, king and soldiers." He says, if the king is good, the soldiers are good as well. And if the king is evil, what would the soldiers be? Evil. Right? So meaning that the heart is the king and he commands. So if he's good, he'll say, protect the citizens, right? Secure them, open this canal, protect them from this. Do things that help other people. So he's good and they're doing good as well because he commands them. Now, if he is, on the other hand, wicked... Right? A criminal, for instance, doesn't have mercy in his heart. The soldiers will start acting like him based on what? Based on his commands. 
Not only subhanAllah, also based on his commands, based on imitation. Based on imitation. They will see what he's interested in, they'll be interested in that as well. Right? There's like an interesting book about, you know, Mushakalatun Nasi Rizamanihim, how people resemble their times. Right? So in that book, it's a small book, but in that book he says, look at what the caliph used to do. He used to love these things. The people, the subjects, also love these things as well. The next caliph after loved a different thing. He says, look how people loved that thing as well. So people imitate, and they imitate people in authority. So that's similar fashion is the heart. So it commands, and the body will listen. Now, I'll give you another example, right? And that example may be more relevant for some of us who are not aware of kings and haven't seen kings and soldiers and so on. Maybe we've thought about it, but we haven't seen it. I'll give you the example of a security firm that is protecting a bank, right? Security firm that is protecting a bank. And there is a control room within the bank for that security firm. And there's a person sitting in that control room. And he has all these screens. And all the cameras are watching every inch of the bank, right? So he can see anything that he wants. And he has also mics, right? So he can pick up any sound. And he has speakers that he can direct the officers and the security, uh, the officers and security guards. He can direct all of them. You be here, you be there, you take your turn here, you take your turn there. So he controls everything. You follow me? So if that person who's sitting behind those controls, if he is honest, if he is alert, he's dedicated to his job, the bank stays safe. Right? If he's not, if he is sick, neglectful, rather than watching really the bank, he's just watching whether the soldiers or the officers are doing, he's just really curious about what they're doing, and he neglects the security of the bank, what happens? The bank is compromised. So, our heart is that control room. And there is sort of a small person who looks like us who's sitting behind those controls. If your eyes are looking at something, this is you are zooming in with the cameras. You ask yourself, why am I looking there? You go back to your heart and the person in their heart is zooming. So why am I watching this? He says, because the person inside your heart wants to see this. Why am I saying this? This is like the speakers in the bank. Why am I saying this? Because the person inside the heart wants to say this. Why am I listening to that? Well, maybe it's not so good. Why am I listening? Why am I so interested in it? It's not random. The person inside your heart wants to listen to it. So everything that is happening, right, through your body, your senses, where they are directed, what they are getting back from the outside world happens because your heart is asking them to do this. And that makes sense. And you know, when you compare that to what the Prophet ﷺ says, that if it's reformed, the rest of the body is reformed. If the person behind the controls, if your heart is reformed, then you won't look at the haram. You won't listen to the haram. And what harms you? You won't walk to it. You won't say something that will hurt you and hurt people that are around you. But when there is something wrong happening on the inside, you love this thing, even though you may not admit it in public, but you love this thing. You are attracted to it. As soon as you listen or you hear it, you'll pay closer attention. As soon as you see a glimpse of it, you will pay closer attention. Right? As soon as people start talking about it, you will start talking about it. Why? Because the heart is asking you to do this. And you will not be able to refuse what the heart wants from you. Until when? Until you reform it. Until you change it. So any project for us to change, any resolution that we have. You know, now the new year started, right? A lot of people have resolutions, mostly non-Muslims. Resolution, this is how we want to change, right? Any plan that you have for change, whether this is something that you want to start, or this is something that is ongoing, you will not be able to be successful unless you include your heart in it, and you take care of it, and you listen to it, and you change it, and unless you do that, you'll not be able to change. It'll be a promise that you make to yourself, it will be a wish, but you will not be successful. Your heart has to be the main factor in that change. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, he says in the hadith, At-taqwa ha-huna. Taqwa is here. 
And he points to his chest, points to his heart. Taqwa is here. What does that mean when he says taqwa is here? Inside my heart. That's where it starts. That's where it originates. That's where it lives. Now it flows from the inside to the outside. Right? So it's not just only in the heart, but it is mainly in the heart. That's where it is. And it's not just on the body. So if the heart does not have a taqwa, the body will not have it. And if it have it, it has it, it's a pretend type of taqwa. It's not a real type of taqwa. So to understand this hadith properly, at taqwa ha huna, right? You have to strike a balance between the outside and the inside. We engage really in a lot of acts of worship or some acts of worship. And we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he rewards us for it. And when we are engaged in those acts of worship, usually what do we focus on? The interior or the exterior of the act? The inside or the outside? Typically in our acts of worship. We focus on the outside. We really take care, for instance, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I'm noting the imbalance. We really take care in perfecting how we pray. Meaning that, where do you put your hands? How do you raise them? What do you do? Where do you stand? Your feet and all of that. And all of that is important because the Prophet ﷺ talked about it. It's important. But sometimes we get so obsessed with details, with very, very small details, and we argue about them. And we spend times and times researching that. And we leave the more fundamental obligation of the heart itself. Is your heart connected to your act of worship or not when you're standing in salah? Right? Is your heart connected to this act of worship or not? So we pay attention to it because of two things, those exteriors of worship. Two things. One, because people are watching us. Right? So I want him to say that I'm following the sunnah, right? Because I'm doing it this way. Right? right? So if you're praying by yourself, you're okay. If somebody stands next to you, just pay attention to where you're putting your hand. Right? Did you, are you waving your finger or not? How are you doing it? Remember what you read in Safat Salat al Remember, right? Do it this way, right? Because he's watching you and you want to be like, I'm following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, right? Because that's what we talk about. Alhamdulillah, this is good. If you're not doing it for his sake, if you just want to follow the sunnah, this is good. But we engage, we get so engrossed in the details that, okay, how about, is your heart present when you are praying? Is, it this, is this salah benefiting you? Is it bringing, bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Some of the exterior acts could be sunnas. But the connection, the presence, the khushu of your heart is an obligation. So we leave the obligation because it's hidden. And we will focus on some of the sunnas. And I'm not saying again neglect, neglect the sunnah. No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is focus on the obligations. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, إِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَا يَنْصَرِفُ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ وَمَا كُتِبَ لَهُ إِلَّا عُشْرُهَا تُسْعُهَا ثُمْنُهَا سُبْعُهَا سُدْسُهَا خُمْسُهَا رُبْعُهَا نِصْفُهَا He says the person would leave his salah and the only part that is written for him, for, for him from that salah is one-tenth, one-ninth. One eighth, one seventh, one sixth, one fifth, one fourth, a half. He mentioned all of that in the hadith. Right? So, obligations wise, he fulfilled that obligation. He prayed physically, he was there, he stood, he prayed, he brought all the movements. But he said he will leave, and the only part of it that is counted for him, the only part that he will be rewarded for that, is what? One tenth. One tenth, if you count it, is less than half a rak'ah of four. Less than half a rak'ah of four. That's when his mind was present in the salah. And maybe even less. Right? So consider this. How much attention do we give to the outside versus the inside? And of reforming our outside versus reforming our inside. And we are so aware of what we do on the outside because other people are watching. But because no one is watching us on the inside except ourselves, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before that, we don't pay attention to it. And that can create what? 
a great imbalance where our acts of worship, fasting, praying, giving zakah become a shell, just an empty shell. And we just do it because it's a habit, but we don't feel anything inside. It fails to do anything for us inside. We do it because it's expected from us. We do it because we are commanded to. Our parents, our spouses, they want us to do this. So we do it. But it doesn't do anything for us because we fail to cultivate, to enrich our hearts. They stop feeling anything in the salah. They stop feeling anything in fasting. Stop feeling anything when listening to the khutbah. Stop feeling anything when we're doing anything because we didn't take care of it. That's why when you hear Abu Darda radiallahu anhu says the, saying the following, you'll understand it. He says, "Istaidu billahi min khushu'in nifaq." Ask Allah's protection from the reverence of hypocrisy or hypocritical reverence. Khushu', but it is hypocritical. Khushu'un nifaq. Ask Allah's protection. Hypocritical reverence. They said, "What is it?" ما خشوع النفاق قال أن يرى الجسد خاشعا والقلب ليس بخاشع. He says that you will see right, the body having خشوع, having reverence, having respect, but the heart has none of that. That is, in a sense, we become good actors, right? And that's a reality. We become good actors. We know how to act the part. How to pray and look, you know, dedicated when we pray. How to speak and we look dedicated when we speak. But he's saying, radiallahu anhu, this is hypocritical reverence because there's nothing inside the heart. So you may look at us on the outside and we're praying and we're doing all the things that we are supposed to do, but you look at the inside of the heart and maybe it's a wasteland. It's empty, right? It's struggling. It's complaining. There is pain. And the salah, because we have failed to connect with it, is not able to solve our pain. Because we didn't let it. We're not paying attention to it. You know how when you pray, that's sort of a khashu'u nifaq you pray and your body, right, is stable, right, is in its place. There is khashu'u. But your heart is racing everywhere. What am I going to eat afterwards? What am I going to cook tonight? These kids are driving me crazy, right? What did I just watch? You're thinking about it. Right? What did I just watch? What will I, what will I watch afterwards? So it's in every valley, crossing every... It's like in this entire world. You're like from one continent to the other. By the time you start the salah, you're in here. By the time you end the salah, you're in China. Thinking about, you know, things, subhanAllah, you know, you didn't... But the shaitan will let you know, and especially sometimes, I don't know if you notice, if you're really worried about something, you don't know where it is, and you start praying, you'll find out where it is. You'll remember. I don't know if you had that experiment or not. Right? The shaitan comes and he says, this, this person is trying to concentrate, I'll show you. You think they're really worried about? It's right there. And you can't wait to finish. You can't wait to finish because you want to go and find it. But you have to know that the shaitan now is competing, competing for your heart and for your attention. Right? So, our minds are racing, our hearts are racing, and there is no khushu' in them, and there is no presence in them. Yes, the body is there, physically is there, but the mind is not there, and the heart is not there. That's why he says, seek Allah's refuge from that. Because when you want to pray, or do anything, you want to ask yourself, Oh my heart, are you with me? Are you with me now as we are standing to pray? Are you with me? Are you listening to the Qur'an with me? Are you actually in ruku' with me, in sujood with me or not? Are you somewhere else? If you're somewhere else, you're not benefiting from what you're doing. Right? And Allah Azza wa Jal and His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not ask us to stand and do meaningless acts. He says, go, stand, prostrate, up, down, up, down, up, down, great. Next person. Right? That's exercise. They did not ask us to do that. They asked us to know, no, connect your heart to what you are doing. And if we find that our hearts are suffering because of that, that our hearts actually need to be remedied, need medicine, then we have to stop and we have to really pay attention to it and to have to treat it. You have to, we have to treat our hearts. We can't, we can't delay that and say later. We can't delay that because people are not watching. No, 
If the heart is not with me, if the heart is in pain, if the heart is complaining, your heart complains to you. Your heart actually complains to you, but we drown it. You know sometimes when you feel tightness in your chest, right? You're upset, you're angry, sometimes you don't know why, sometimes you're incredibly bored and you don't know why. These are messages that your heart is sending to you. He says, save me. Oh, sorry here. Okay. We say, save me. This is akin to what? Like to, when you're hungry, this is a message from what? From your stomach is telling you, feed me. You need energy, feed me. Right? So you know you're familiar with that signal. Oh, I need to eat. So you go and you feed yourself, and alhamdulillah, now you're fine. The next time you get, get hungry, it's the same thing. There's a signal. Well, the heart also sends signals. And these are the signals. Tightness in your chest. You know, inability to enjoy things around you. Feeling fed up with life. Feeling depressed. Feeling down. All of these things are signs, right? Are signals that the heart is sending and say, there's emptiness. Fill me with something. I'm empty. Fill me with something. So Al-Hasan Al-Basri radiyallahu anhu said, Dawi qalbaka fa inna hajat Allahi ila al-ibadi salahu qulubihim. He says, treat your heart, cure your heart. Because what Allah wants from you is for you to treat your heart. Right? What Allah wants from you is for you to treat your heart. That is, take care of it. More than you take care of anything else. Your appearance or, or the exterior type of worship is to take care of that interior part. More so. Because that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. And you all know the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ Where no money, right, and no wealth, and no children will be of benefit to a person, except the person who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a heart that is described as salim, right? Salim meaning healthy, right? Free of disease. Salim in what sense? Salim that it has the love of Allah in it and the love of his prophet, and the fear of Allah in it. And not the dominant, what is dominant in it is not the love of the dunya or the love of the self. There's tawheed in it and there is no shirk. There is sunnah in it and there is no bid'ah, so, and so on and so on. That heart is the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you come to me with such a heart, then that will benefit you. Then you will be saved. Other heart that is not salim will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be questioned about, what is missing from your heart and why is it missing? So the greatest attention to need to be paid to the heart, brothers and sisters. And there's here a part that I want to mention about, we talked about how reform doesn't happen except with the heart, right? Well, as parents, as spouses, we're responsible for more than ourselves, right? We're responsible for our spouses. You know, if you are married and you have a wife or the wife has a husband, you're responsible for each other. And if you have children, you also are responsible for them. And you're responsible for their not only Islamic observance of Allah's commands, but also you're responsible for their hearts as well. How are their hearts doing? And you find here that the trouble sometimes is that we ask people, ask our spouses, ask our children, do this, right? Exterior observation of Allah's commands, do this. But we neglect to include their interior as well. We neglect to include their hearts as well. So when they grow up, what do they grow up with? With a, an external performance of these acts of worship. Why do they pray? Because my father and mother told me to pray. They may not understand why they should pray. They haven't connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on an emotional level with their hearts. They're just asking me to pray. Why to fast? Why, why put on the hijab? Why do this? Why do that? Because they are asking me to do it. And a lot of times they will do it just to keep the peace because they don't want to argue with you. Sometimes they will argue with you. Sometimes they will tell you, I'm now not going to do this. And the reason that I will say that is that because they fail to connect with that on an emotional level. They just know the external 
performance of that worship. And that is it. It doesn't mean anything to them. Because if it means something to them, then perhaps they will continue. So this is a message for us, right? That we can't continue like that. Whether we're living in non-Muslim countries or even, subhanAllah, when we're living in Muslim countries. Because nowadays, right, with that information, you know, the flow of information, how and how easily it flows, and with the technology, you can access anything anywhere. And you'll find that the teachings of Islam, right, are being attacked daily, right? That they don't make sense, that religion itself doesn't make sense. That the religion of Islam is this and that. So a person living in a Muslim country as well is receiving this message and it sees around him, right? The underperformance of Muslims when it comes to Islam, how they actually sully the name of Islam because everybody cheats, everybody lies. And then he looks at that and looks at all the accusations and he's living or she's living in a Muslim country and then they say, I, I don't really care about all of this. I'm not interested in Islam at all. I've seen the image of Islam in Muslims around me. All these people are telling me that Islam is bad hasn't been able to connect with Islam emotionally, and so they leave Islam in a Muslim country. And this is happening. So if it's happening in a Muslim country, more of that is happening in non-Muslim countries as well. So we can't just emphasize the shell or this, this hull of do it because I told you to do it. They have to connect with it on the inside. Why are you praying? Why does Allah want that from you? Do you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Cultivate their love for Allah. Cultivate a connection that they would have with it. Cultivate a connection, an emotional connection that they have with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and talk to them about it from a young age so that when they grow up, they grow up what? Loving Allah and loving his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and where the act of worship means something to them. Right? It becomes what? Self-motivated. You can't force them all the time. There will come a time when they will be old enough that they can say no to you. There will come a time when they will be independent and they will not be under your watch, right? And they will do whatever you, they want. In fact, for some of us, some of us Muslims, as soon as they leave the house and they're outside, they change. Their appearance, their demeanor, what they do, it changes because no one is watching. We have to tell them that I don't need to watch you. Because Allah is watching you. You are with Allah at all times and you're dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we need to cultivate in people and in our children in, in, and in ourselves. I want to mention a few things, inshallah, about the centrality of the heart. Why is the heart so important and central in addition to everything that we said? And these are really inter interesting, interesting points that will help you appreciate, you know, how fundamental it is. That when the Prophet says, it is fundamental. It is the core. You will believe that it is the core. Any command in the Quran and the Sunnah, even if it is a physical command, right, must descend first on the heart. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Aqimu salah, pray. Before you actually pray, what part of your body must receive it? Your heart must receive it. And your heart must accept it. And your heart must decide that I'm going to do it. So the command or the first organ in your body that is responsible, even when the command is physical, which is salah, is your heart. So every command in the Quran passes through the heart first. And sometimes there will be commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will not be able to perform. And there will be prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you will have to commit out of necessity. So apparently, you will look like a person who is breaking the law. But it is the heart that distinguishes between who is really breaking the law and who is not. I'll give you an example. Right? There is a person who is about to die, a very famous example, a person who is about to die. So he has to eat dead meat or pig meat. Right? Out of necessity. The act looks what? Like you're breaking the law. What distinguishes between that and a person who's actually eating that because they enjoy it? Your heart. Because your heart is still believing that this is haram. Right? Even though your body has to do something else, but your heart believes this is haram afterwards. I won't continue eating it. Right? Let's suppose an act, a command of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
Allah commands you to give zakah, you don't have money to give zakah. Your body is not giving zakah. But your heart is still engaged in worship. Why? Because it believes it to be from Allah Azza wa Jal. And that when you have the money, you're going to do it. So your heart is still engaged in worship, even though your body is not. You follow me? You with me still? Okay. There are acts of worship that belong to the heart exclusively and not to the body. Like what? Tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's from the worship of the heart. That's not the body. Love, that is from the worship of the heart, not the body. Sincerity, ikhlas, from the heart, not the body. It will have an effect on the body, but it's a worship of the heart. Right? Your body may not be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. Your heart is able to. That's a ni'mah. Your heart, in fact, can do miracles if you just listen to what's going to come next. It can do miracles while you're just sitting here. It can do a lot. Because Allah may tell you do something, you're unable to do it. But as we said, your heart believes in it. Allah rewards you for that. Right? Allah may tell you do something. You know, travel, there's, you know, a, uh, a circle of knowledge, right, over there, a sheikh over there, travel, so that you will listen to him. So you say, I want to travel to listen to him. So you travel, but in the middle of the road, right, you cannot continue. Unforeseen circumstances, you cannot continue. But in your heart, you really want to be there. Allah will give you the reward of someone who attended. Though you're not there, but you took the steps to be there, and it was... Unforeseen circumstances that stopped you, but your heart wants to be there, and you're there. That's why in the hadith, the Prophet says, roughly the meaning of which, that there are people in Medina, wherever you go, Allah will reward them as He is rewarding you. Though they stayed back in Medina, and you are on your way for jihad. They say, why you Prophet of Allah? He said, they were held back by excuses, but their intention is that they want to be with you. So you could be sitting in your home, and your intention is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give you the reward of someone who is elsewhere. I've taken th traveled thousands of miles just because of your intention. And see the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. Your body will not be able to worship Allah all the time. There are constraints in your body, right? You're sitting, you are working, right? You can't travel here, you cannot be in the masjid at all, at all time. Your heart at the same time can worship Allah continuously, without stop, as long as you are awake. Thanking Allah, being grateful for Him, being content, being patient, remembering something good. Allah, all continuously your heart is doing something while you're sitting down. And also, your intention makes a lot of difference. A lot of us may not know this or forget about it. Your intention of the heart makes really a lot of difference. Because Allah could give you a huge sum of reward or also a lot of sin based on what you intend to do, even though you haven't done anything yet. How so? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, and I'll say this hadith in, in English, right? So that, you know, we save time, inshallah. nafar. This is the hadith. Dunya belongs to four people, or there are four types of people in this dunya. He says, a person that Allah had given him both knowledge and money. So he acts with his money according to the proper knowledge that Allah had given him. And he spends it the way that Allah wants him to spend it. This is the best, best person. So he has ilm and he has mal. How does he spend it? The way that Allah loves. That's the best person. And another person that Allah had given him ilm, knowledge, but no wealth. And he says, if I, Allah would give me money, I would do the same as that person who has money and he is spending it in the way that Allah loves. If Allah had given me money, I would do as that person is doing. The Prophet says, فَهُوَ بِنِيَّتِهِ فَأَجْرُهُمَا سَوَاء He has a good intention, the reward is similar. Follow? What did he do? What did he do? Intention. He doesn't have money, but his intention is truthful intention. If Allah were to give me this, I will do the same as that person. He says they will have the same reward. 
Because Allah knows if he were to give him that money, he will do the same. He didn't spend a cent. The third person is Allah, someone who Allah had given him money, but no knowledge. So he's going left and right with it, doing whatever upsets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, this is the worst person. So money and no knowledge, no guide. And that's, that's by the way, then you will see then why money is not a ni'mah, why not a blessing then, when you don't know what to do with it. Money, but without a guide, without knowledge to tell you what to do. He says, he says this is the worst person. And the fourth person is one who has, has no money and no knowledge, no ilm. So what does he say? He looks at that person and he says, at that person who wastes his money and does whatever upsets Allah with it, he says, if I have money, I would do what he does with it. So he says, فَهُوَ بِنِيَّتِهِ His intention is the same, فَوِزْرُهُمَا سَوَاءَ Their sin is the same. Because he can't wait to do the same thing. If I just have that money, I'll go gamble with it and pay, I'll pay, uh, buy, buy alcohol and spend it on women and spend it on this. He doesn't have anything. But he says, if I get it, I will do the same thing. He says, the same sin. That's what happens. What? Sitting down, you're just sitting down watching them on TV, right? Or reading about it in the news. I wish I had that kind of money. I, I, I would do the same thing, right? That's why it's very dangerous, right? That's why I have to pay attention to your heart and what your intention in your heart is telling you. Because it's going to influence the type of person you are. Right? The type of actions that we do, in fact, both of us you know, can do you know, a similar act of worship. Both of us would be praying. Both of us could have ikhlas, right? And Allah will accept all of that. But because you have more good intentions than I do, your act will be better. Right? I'm giving sadaqah. I'm giving sadaqah because I just want to purify my wealth. You're giving sadaqah because you want to purify your wealth and you want to help that person and you want to prevent him from begging and also you want to prevent him from going to someone who is going to force them to change their religion, etc., etc., etc. The more good intentions you have when you perform an act, the more that your reward is. Same act. So, كَثِّرُ niyat. That is, add your intention. Whenever you find a good intention, add it to the things that you are doing. Because that will give you more reward for it. And the last thing I'll mention about the importance of the heart is that because the shaitan knows that this is the center and this is the core, that's the place that he would want to occupy. So, he will send his soldiers on to the heart. The shubuhad, the shahawa, the temptations, the doubts, they will never leave. Right? And that is the battleground between you and the shaitan. That's where it's being waged, inside. And you may look at the person and find that that person is very quiet, very peaceful, very keeping to himself. Were Allah to reveal to you what's inside, you'll feel that there is a battle raging on. Right? Between the soldiers of the shaitan and the soldiers of ar-Rahman. Between the angels of Allah and the shaitan. And they're fighting. And there are casualties. And the person is suffering on the inside. But you can't feel it. And I, I, I suspect that all of us had felt this at one point or the other. People around you can't feel it. But it's right there inside. Something that is bothering you. The shaitan is fighting with you. And you're fighting with the shaitan. And that's why the, that spot is the most important spot. And that's why it needs our outmost attention. I want to move on to the second part of hadith, insha'Allah, which is what about halal and haram, right? Halal ubayyin wal haram ubayyin, ay wadihun la labsa fi. So he says, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, halal is clear and haram is clear. What does it mean that it's clear? It means that it is accessible and comprehensible. Meaning what? Meaning that if you want to know what halal and haram is, you can. Isn't that what it means when it says clear? It's not hidden. Clear. Comprehensible. Where do I know it from? Either it's a general knowledge, especially if you're growing among Muslims, it's general knowledge. And sometimes even with non-Muslims, they know. Oh, alcohol, you guys don't drink alcohol, right? You guys, I'm surprised that they know that we eat halal so much. You know, you go to someone who eat halal. They know that very well. So, they know. Right? So, Either it's general knowledge. 
alcohol is haram, zina, you know, fornication is haram, etc. Everybody knows. Or if it is not, it's right there clear in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Or you can go to the alim, to the scholar, and you ask them, and you say, yeah, yeah, this is halal, and this is the evidence. The Quran says this, the Sunnah says that. No, it's haram, the Quran says this, the Sunnah says that. Very clear. Halal and haram are clear. But between them, the Prophet ﷺ says they are mutashabihat or mushabbahat. Ambiguous matters, doubtful matters. Now what are these? These matters are those that are you not sure. Are they halal or are they haram? That's what they call mutashabihat because they look alike. But actually, if you want to translate it literally, they look alikes. Because they look like this and they look like that. They look like halal a little bit. They look like haram a little bit. And you don't know exactly. So, this ambiguous matters, first of all, are relative. Not everything in the Sharia or a lot of these matters are actually in themselves ambiguous. It's ambiguous because I don't know them. But when you go to the alim and he tells you, no, I'll tell you, it is actually halal. Here's the evidence. So it was ambiguous for me, right? It was ambiguous for the alim who has more knowledge. Right? It's doubtful for me, but when you go to the alim, he'll tell you it's haram and that you have to avoid it. So a large chunk of those ambiguous matters will be eliminated when you ask, is this halal or is this haram? Then you will be told. But not all of them. طيب? Not all of them. Some of them will remain. Ambiguous matters. Why are they ambiguous and doubtful? It's because there is disagreement between the scholars about them. Some scholars say halal, some scholars say haram. Do you know? Scratch your head and you say, is it halal or is it haram? You don't know. And where the disagreement is strong. right? Not a minor disagreement, a strong disagreement. Or, the circumstances around it makes it harder to render or to give judgment about it. It may be halal or haram, but in those specific circumstances, can I do this or not? It's difficult to say. Or some information is missing about this thing, and you don't really know. And the scholar, even sometimes when you ask them, they don't really know. Especially, you know, in new matters that are happening today, or in global matters, right? Is this a halal transaction or haram? Some of them are very clear. Some of them the scholar would have to sit and say, I need to study this. This is something new. Or in your circumstance, I can't tell you until I understand your circumstance. You follow me? Because maybe there is a sense of necessity or a sense of need that you have. Right? Like for instance the example that we've given. Is it halal to eat dead meat? No, it's haram. Is it haram all the time? No, right? So well, there will be times, you know, between those limits, right? Where you say, I have to take a bite just to save myself. Can I take another bite? Then that's doubtful. Maybe, maybe not. You don't know. Now, if you don't need the other bite, you don't take it. You just need what sustains you. But maybe at that point, you don't know. You don't know what the ruling is, so it's doubtful. So there will be some doubtful matters. Follow me. So what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say about them? He says the one who avoids them protects his religion and honor. Protects his religion and reputation. Why your reputation? Because when people see you doing these things, they'll start talking about you. And not so much that you have to worry about what people are saying about you, but if it will bring harm to you, avoid it. If you're going to do something that will have people start talking bad things about you, avoid it. Right? And don't give the chance for the shaitan to enter between you and your brother and to enter between you and your sister. Right? Maybe you remember that hadith when the Prophet wasallam in one night he was talking to his wife and then a couple of companions saw him so they walked very swiftly. They, he caught up with them and he said, Ala mahlikuma, ala raslikuma, innaha safiya. He says, wait, this is safiya. Right? So they said, Prophet of Allah, we're never going to doubt you. He said, the shaitan runs in the Adam in the vessels where the bloods run. Right? That he has very much control, very strong control. 
and he can whisper to you anything. And were you to think this about the Prophet ﷺ, you would be doomed. Right? So he ﷺ was eager to say, no, 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 it's not as you think. So he's saying that if you avoid these doubtful matters, you will protect your reputation. And also you will protect, protect your religion. How so? It will explain. Because the person who engages in them, the Prophet ﷺ says, will engage in the haram. If there are doubtful matters around you, you don't know they are halal or haram, and you decide just to do them and keep doing them because you don't know they are halal or haram, the Prophet says, you've fallen into the haram or you're about to fall into it. Why? Because of two things. Either because some of these matters are actually haram, and you don't know yet, you suspect them to be haram, but they're actually haram, so when you do them, you have, you have done the haram. Right? Or because, and that's important to keep in mind, or because when you do the doubtful so many times, the distance between you and the haram shrinks, and you are emboldened to commit the haram after. So if you can do what you doubt, there might be haram in it. Meaning, they say, for instance, an example, this person, and this is not you know, uh, a call for us to judge anybody else. But this person earns his money from halal and from haram. He invites me to his home. Do I go? Do I not go? This person earns most of his money from haram. All his money from haram. Invites me to his home. Do I accept the invitation? As long as this is doubtful for you and you don't know what the ruling is, if you partake of the doubtful and there's a suspicion of haram later on, it'd be easier for you to commit the blatant haram, the clear haram. Because the distance between you and the haram has been bridged. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. Because in another riwayah that you'll find in Al-Bukhari, it says, فَمَنْ تَرَكَ مَا شُبِّهَ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ كَانَ لِمَسْتَبَانَ أَتْرَكَ وَمَنْ إِشْتَرَأَ عَلَى مَا يُشَكُّ فِيهِ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ أَوْشَكَ أَنْ يُوَاقِعَ مَسْتَبَانَ He says, the one who leaves what he suspects to be sinful, he will leave the clear sin, or more likely to leave what is clearly sinful. Was that clear? Was the translation clear? Should I say it again? It says, the one who leaves the potential sin is more likely to leave the clear one. And the one who indulges in the doubtful is about to violate what's clear. That's in Al-Bukhari. Another narration of this hadith. So you cross into what is doubtful. Oh, the ulama disagree, it's fine and it's okay. Somebody has an opinion. You hear that sometimes, right? Maybe the majority of the ulama say that this is haram. But again, going back to the heart, I like this thing to be halal. So I'll find for me one alim who says that it's halal. And it becomes a doubtful matter and a matter that is discreet upon. And the evidence, you know, you can look at it this way and that way. And ya khi, don't be, you know, so strict. And ah, khalas. You do it. You're doing it. You're doing it. And subhanallah, it's not useful then to go and necessarily argue with that person. Because the reason why I adopted this position is not because of evidence. The reason I adopted this position is because of what? I want it to be so. I want it to be halal. I just looked for the evidence to make it halal and then I want it to be halal. Or I want this thing to be haram. I don't want Islam to call for this because they're attacking me because of it. So I'll make it haram. You know, for instance, um, uh, it just came to my mind. Um, the age of Aisha radiallahu anha when the Prophet sallallahu married her, right? Because they attack it, right, so much, and because some Muslims, some of us, you know, who really feel threatened, right, because of all of these attacks and we don't have the ammunition to reply, We'll just hold on to any piece of evidence that says she wasn't the age that she was when the Prophet married her. Because it makes us feel better. Though that this is in Al-Bukhari, though this is an authentic hadith, you will find someone who says contrary to that and will take that position. It just makes me feel better. It's not a good methodology of research or affirming truth, but it's just I feel it this way. So I want it to be halal, I want it to be haram, so I will make it halal and haram. So again, it goes back to the heart. So when you want to fix that, 
You don't fix it necessarily based on fiqh. You can argue with that person till the cows come home. I don't know when the cows come home. But when the cows come home, you can argue with that. He will not listen to you. Mind is set. This needs to be halal. That's it. And those of you who say it's haram, you are strict. That's it. They have a category for you and a category for himself. Or this thing has to be haram. That's it. I have a category for others who accept it to be haram and a category for all of you who say that it is halal. A classification. So it's it. So it's not a matter of evidence. It's not a matter of fiqh. It's a matter of the heart. Is your heart willing to accept the truth or not? So what is the connection between these two hadiths? The connection between two of them is that what? Who is the person who is going to avoid the haram? And who is the person who is going to avoid these doubtful matters? The person whose heart is clear and healthy. That's what he's talking about, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fil jasadi mudgha. How is your body going to react and stay away from it or actually do it? Goes back to your heart. Because if your heart is healthy, your body is healthy. If your heart is diseased, your body is diseased. How you will be reacting to all of this depends on what lives inside my heart and your heart. That's the connection between the two. So those of us who will stay away from the doubtful are those of us who fear Allah in their hearts and love Allah in their hearts. And those of us who will partake of the doubtful and the haram are those who have the love of the dunya dominant in their hearts. And they can't leave whatever that thing is, so they will do it. That's the connection. And another correct connection also, and keep that in mind, that second connection for the upcoming hadiths, is that whatever you do of halal and haram and doubtful has an effect on your heart. So maybe perhaps your heart is clean. But for some reason you're doing something haram or doing something that is doubtful, it will begin to change your heart. And we'll see that inshallah and how that happens next time. But this is the connection between the two. So alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, this is the conclusion of the uh, explanation of this hadith. I'll leave some time, some space for uh, questions, and maybe I've forgotten something, or you would like to add a comment, or share with us a lesson from the hadith, or a lesson of today, then jazakumullah khaira, I'm here, and I will sit and listen to you, and if the sisters also have some questions, please, you know, find a way to bring these questions to us, if there are any questions, inshallah, yeah, inshallah, the two connections, inshallah, so, the one, the two connections between the first part of the hadith and the second part. The first connection is that those who will avoid the haram and the doubtful matters are those who will have a living, sound heart. Right? So if there is salah in my heart and in your heart, we will avoid what the Prophet ﷺ wants us to avoid. But if there is some corruption, there is some fasad, we will do what Allah had prohibited. So this is how you can find out about yourself the state of your heart. That's the first connection. The second connection is that whatever we do on the outside affects us on the inside as well. So it's not just the heart going to the outside and affecting it. Also what we do on the outside will find its way to the inside. So if I'm doing something wrong on the outside, it will change my heart and corrupt it on the inside. So think of it, so think of it right, as a two-way street between you between the inside and the outside. What's on the inside will affect and move to the outside. And what you do on the outside will move and affect what's on the inside. And will be, that second connection will be clearer, inshallah, when we move on to the other hadiths, inshallah, in this collection. Oh, so, okay, so if there are questions, right? Okay, inshallah. So I don't know if we have any questions or not, or the sisters have any questions or not. It seems that we don't uh, have it. Also, if you have any type of advice, inshallah, or suggestions for me or for anybody, Barakallah Fikr, involved in this uh, a project, please let us know. Sometimes you need to remind us more than one time because we forget. So don't despair and don't say that they're not listening. You know, just keep at it and keep reminding me and keep reminding them. And be in Allah Azza wa Jal, we'll find a way to accommodate everybody. So I think I think that we are done.
we're done inshallah jazakum allah khair assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh subhanak allahu wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.